reference from Dr. Radman actually shows some of the key differences between positivism. So if you're using quantitative research, you'll be using a post-positivist uh, paradigm or post-positivist um, uh, epistemology. So the difference between positivism and interpretivism. Look how th these really are um, one side or the other of, of, of the same coin. So if, it's a, if something is objective in natural sciences, you can actually observe the facts of it. Whereas from social science point of view, something's going to be individual, um, particular to, uh, to each and every person. So when you're talking about domestic violence and abuse, it could be from a, an objective point of view, you want to count the numbers. How many people in the UK have been victims of domestic violence and abuse? Whereas from a social science point of view, you might say, well, it's going to be difficult to even getting those numbers in the first place because lots of people don't even categorise it like that. Or look at how people from some ethnicities, some cultures, some religions might think once a man and woman get married, and in their cultural religion, maybe only men and women can get married, once a man and woman gets married, she's his um, uh, responsibility. And if he gives her a slap, she might turn and say, I obviously did something wrong to deserve it. Now, that's a completely different ball game to counting observable facts and figures, because the individual meaning ascribed to something may mean that a person won't even use the term domestic violence or abuse. Another good example here would be about depression. Supposing you're talking about postnatal depression. Look how people from some cultures and ethnicities don't even use the word depression, especially not in the way in which it's often used in the West. So if you're a health visitor and you're going around to a person's house and you're going to do use the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale and you want to work out how depressed they are and you ask them, are you feeling depressed? So you want objective, observable facts. You want to know, are you depressed? Are you not depressed? You ask them the question and they might say, no, I'm not depressed, because maybe the, uh, the word doesn't even exist in their language. They don't see themselves as being depressed. But then you notice by their demeanour or the fact that they say, but I'm not depressed at all. I just can't stop crying all the time. So because of that, then what you're observing is their interpretation of something that you're going to label as depression. When it comes to positivism against interpretivism, again, if you look at realism, um, facts, seeing how something can be true, only if we can capture that truth, and therefore we need the right methods to do it. And from some positivist uh, perspectives, they would say, but if, if we can't label something as true yet, it's only because we haven't learned the right ways to explore this. Whereas interpretivism will see, yes, there may be a truth out there, but not that you can say, well, this is it from a realist point of view. This is what the truth is, because it's subjective to each, in, each individual. So there's no truth in the singular, but truths as in as many of us that exist. And positivism will talk about something being uh, value free, whereas interpretivism see cultural and historical uh, influences even on the data collection that we do. And a really good example here is from the statistics in the, uh, in the UK on HIV. If you look at the modes of transmission of HIV, you will see that there's, um, when you see the figures and it's got bar charts, there's male to male transmission, um, male to female or uh, female to male, so heterosexual transmission, um, injecting drug use, uh, vertical transmission, blood products, other. Okay, these different categories. But when you look at those statistics, and especially when you look at the, the heterosexual transmission, rather than just one column, it's actually split. So it may be looking at um, heterosexual transmission overseas 
as opposed to UK. And yet it doesn't break that down for the, uh, for the gay sex, gay and bisexual. So why, why break one down and not the other? So how could it ever be value free when whoever invented those columns in the first place are imposing their values on these things? Because if you look at those statistics, it looks as if, oh, there's a huge column of gay and bisexual in the UK, but heterosexuals, the majority of heterosexuals living with HIV in the UK happen to be black sub-Saharan African people. So that's a huge column. If you're looking at white heterosexuals, UK, it's quite a small one. So that could be, again, giving the impression of othering. It's other people's issues. So if you're not gay or bisexual male, if you're not black, sub-Saharan African, you're okay. Okay. So although this is talking from a positivist point of view about being value free, qualitative researchers would ask, how can anything ever be really value free? And that's one of the reasons why positivism now talks about itself as being post positivist, because a lot of post positivist researchers are trying to be enlightened on so many of these other issues, realizing nothing can be so objective as to be the truth on a particular topic, because all truth is some level or other socially constructed. So looking at your research from an interpretivist uh, point of view, you could say that you're looking at um, exploring the phenomena under um, investigation at different stages and in different ways. So I'll make this into um, um, a different slide set for you so you can come back and have a look at this. And then when it comes to um, the various epistemologies, again, start looking at uh, the, the lens in which you want to explore different phenomena. So which ep epistemological stance are you coming from? And I'm just giving you the example of one here, which is feminism. Look how feminism may look at all these different uh, um, dimensions of life from very different perspectives. So even if you use the term feminist, and if you say, oh, I'm doing a feminist critique, look how feminism may explore things in so many different ways or different waves of feminism, different elements of feminism. So you may have to say, well, it's not just feminist, um, uh, a feminist paradigm I'm using. I'm actually exploring it from and say which part of feminism or which type of understanding. Because if you're looking at trans people, for example, some feminists are open to the notion of gender transformation. Others are not, um, and they would be exclusionary. So if a person was assigned male at birth and transitions to female, some females would welcome them, others would be most uh, would be more um, hostile even uh, against them and remember with your studies you also um, have to keep ethics right at the heart of everything that you're doing here so uh, even from the point of view of doing particular um, uh, methods you, you might have to ask well is that going to be ethical because supposing supposing you're asking really delicate or sensitive questions of individuals and maybe op opening a can of worms but how are you being kind to the individual? It's no good saying, well, I want to do face-to-face -face interviews with people and ask them about their, their terrible traumas in life or to explore their post-traumatic stress disorder with them if you're not going to give them any backup or any follow-up or any support or give them uh, um, referrals to others that may be able to help them. You know, if you've been affected by this, look how many television programs, when they cover sensitive issues, may have a warning beforehand, and maybe even at the end of it, a referral saying, if you've been affected by this, here's the phone number or the website or what to do. So you have to make sure that your study is ethically um, sound, and that's why it's imperative that you go through the School Ethics Committee to get approval for anything that you're proposing to do. And for all of you working in various trusts, normally then you show your ethics approval to your particular trusts, and they may have different perspectives on it as well, um, or they might just rubber stamp it and um, allow you through. But you must be ethical in all that you're doing. Also, when it comes to qualitative research, and a big difference between qualitative and quantitative, is that qualitative often wants to listen to those voices that aren't often heard. 
So it's to marginalised people or voices which are silenced by others. And a really great friend of mine, Professor um, Laura Serrant, back in 2010, she uh, published quite a few bits of work. And if you check Laura's work out, you'll see here that she's written a lot on screaming silences. And um, even the word obedience, remember I used to be a Catholic priest and was under a vow of obedience. I don't think I'm very good at that. But the, the, the word obedience literally means to listen attentively to. So it's really important to listen out to those voices that are hidden, marginalised, um, silenced by others. Okay? And in doing that, by giving people voice, that in itself is empowering of individuals because maybe nobody's ever listened to them before but also you've got ethical responsibilities with empowerment is no good say for example if you're working in accident and emergency uh, like i mentioned earlier and somebody comes in who's the victim of domestic violence or abuse and you say to them oh well, if i were you i wouldn't stick with them i'd get up and leave and they get up and leave and then they're murdered it's no good giving people um, any form of power or empowerment if there's going to be a detrimental impact in the way in which that's enacted. So they've got to know that with empowerment comes uh, different res rights, responsibilities and sensitivities as well. Also, the qualitative research is about revealing subjugated knowledges. So it could be when there's a look back in history. So now uh, in 2020, for example, when um, there have been big campaigns around Black Lives Matter or anybody that's been hidden throughout the past. So post-colonial studies would be a great way of looking at histories that have been buried or hidden or um, famous gays throughout the ages. If that type of study can be done, so looking at, his, looking at the history of sexual orientations. Now, there's a problem there because even the word gay is culturally specific to modern times and not applicable to past times. So there's a whole, a whole load of ways in which we should be looking at all of this to explore subjugated, buried, hidden uh, knowledges. And obviously that means uncovering inequalities. And even when you look at um, inequalities in health, Look how so many people are excluded. Now, could it be because of reasons of poverty or homelessness? They haven't got a fixed abode to give you on an address form. Um, whether they've got the education to fill in a 50 page form to claim their disability benefit. So there's so many ways in which inequalities impact on people's lives and on their health and their well-being. And going back to ethics again, here are the four pillars of ethics that really must underpin uh, all of your research. And when it comes to you doing your research studies, look at your professional codes of conduct, look at the professions you come from, because your, your regulatory bodies may have also written an ethics um, uh, code of conduct for your specific uh, profession as well. But the key ones are uh, doing good, beneficence, making sure that you're being just to everyone, not doing any harm. And that could even be the harm when I mentioned you think you're empowering someone by te telling an individual to leave an abusive relationship. And at this moment in time, that may not be the best approach to do. So doing no harm and empowering people by giving them autonomy. And even when you look at language in healthcare, look at the big difference between um, compliance and adherence, okay? So how does autonomy relate to someone um, who's being non-compliant? And what can you do to empower someone to be more adherent to their medication regime? Another key element of uh, qualitative research is something called reflexivity. Now, all of us in health and social care professions, we're all accustomed to being reflective practitioners. It's part and parcel of the studies that we do. So whether we're reflecting in practice as something's happening or reflecting later on practice and a combination of both. So we're accustomed to it, but it's really important in healthcare, uh, in healthcare research and social care research, that we are being reflexive practitioners as being reflexive researchers. 
Because for you as an individual doing your study, you're key to making sense of this. It's not as if there's an objective um, world outside of you and you're looking in on it. You're part of, in qualitative research, you're part of this because you're essential to make sense of all the data that you're finding, even the way in which you go out to find it. You're um, essential for part of that. And the term bricola here is referring to you as a drawing from different types of research studies and genres. And that's why um, the, the, the study that you're developing may be quite unique. So you may be looking, well, have others done similar things, but you're not going out to repeat particular studies. Say, for example, if it was a randomized control trial, it might be an RCT done on one particular type of COVID vaccine. And then you know, once they've done it through these methods, we can do the same methods, exactly the same, and we should expect to find similar findings. With qualitative research, no, you may be mixing and matching from different theories, uh, different practices, different types of research studies to create something that's particularly new and novel in relation to your specific um, field of inquiry. And reflexivity also inquires you um, to reflect on whether you're bringing any prejudice uh, into the research in which you're doing. You may be starting off from the point of view thinking, oh, I want to explore a particular topic, I want to explore such and such a thing, but by choosing to do that, are you excluding anyone? So you need to be really uh, careful here, be reflective on who are you including, but on those that you're excluding as well. And that's really important during your study when you're writing it up, that's when you'd acknowledge this type of thing. So be upfront about it so that the reader of your dissertation can actually feel you in it as well. They can see you and they can get behind some of the thought processes you've had in why you've chosen some things and not chosen others. And I want to give you a really good example here. When I was doing my own um, doctoral research, when I was transcribing the data, so I did focus groups, and I had uh, um, a little stereo digital recorder sat in the middle of the room, and all the participants were around this. Sometimes it was groups of four people. The largest I had was a group of 18. So when it came to transcribing the data, and that can really take a long time. So for every one hour of recording I had was taking me about seven hours of transcription time. So build all of that into your study as well. But what I was doing was um, I, I had earpieces in to listen to the tape recordings, but then I had a Bluetooth headset over and above that for voice recognition software. So I was having to listen to what these people in the focus group were saying. I'd have to say it out loud so it was being picked up by the microphone and then typing in the screen in front of me. So I'm having to look at the screen, so I'm listening, speaking, hearing, uh, uh, seeing, okay, all at the same time. And all of a sudden, one of the respondents, her voice was quite quiet, and it seemed as if she was saying something about the problems of sexuality. Very ginger people. And I thought to myself, what did she just say? So I played it back. And she talks about the problems of sexuality for ginger people. And I thought, I'm sure she's saying for ginger people. So I played it over and over and over again, and it came out the same each time. So I then went to Google and I typed in problems of sexuality for ginger people. Nothing came back at all. So I thought, what is she saying? So I played it over a few more times, and then all of a sudden, about DRA to listen attentively, I heard her um, exact. Uh, I heard exactly what she was saying. She spoke about the problems of sexuality and gender for people. But I could have gone off and written a whole thesis on ginger people. So that's why it's really important for you to listen attentively to what people are saying. Listen to the meanings behind the words that they're saying as well.